So yeah, there's quite a bit of grammar in physics. So let's do this! All measurements fall into one of two categories, either scalar or vector. A scalar quantity is any measurement without a direction associated with it. For example, I walk 3 kilometers to get to school, or I jog at 3 meters per second. Scalar quantities don't care about direction, so if I walk positive 3 kilometers to get to school, I still walk positive 3 kilometers to get back home. A vector quantity is exactly like what this character says. It's a quantity with a measurement and direction. For example, I walk 3 kilometers west to get to school. You'll always see an arrow written on top of the symbol of a vector quantity. You might have seen this triangle symbol before. It's the Greek letter delta, and it means a change in. For example, from 8 o'clock until 8 o'clock in 5 seconds, it took me 5 seconds to say this line. There are three very different words used to describe lengths. You probably know distance already. There's a triangle in the symbol because you need to change locations in order to move a distance. Also, distance does not care about direction. You'll have to drive 523 kilometers to get to Montreal, and then you'll have to drive 523 kilometers to get back to the 6. I mean Toronto. Position is where you are located in reference to a known location, kind of like latitude and longitude in geography. For example, your toothbrush is located 1 meter north of the faucet. Since position is a vector quantity, that's why there's an arrow on top of the letter D. Lastly, displacement is a vector quantity, describing where you are now compared to where you started. As you can see in the mathematical formula, displacement is defined as a change in position. Let's briefly compare the difference between distance and displacement using a scaled diagram. As the name implies, all scaled diagrams need a scale and a compass rows. The blue line represents a distance that is traveled. Meanwhile, the purple line represents a displacement. Displacement is always represented by a straight line as it describes the net travel of a person or object. Comparing between the magnitudes of both lengths, distance is usually longer than displacement. At best, distance will only match displacement if you travel in a straight line. The symbol for speed is the letter V. You'll see why it's important in a moment. Speed is defined as the change in distance divided by time. That's why you might be running at 2.6 meters per second. Velocity, on the other hand, is a vector quantity, so you'll be running at 2.6 meters per second forwards. Also, velocity is mathematically defined as displacement divided by time. In general, there are certain directions that are sometimes defined as positive directions, like forwards, upwards, northwards, eastwards, and to the right. And the opposite direction would be written as the negative values. You don't have to follow this rule, but it's a common convention to follow. Let's review through the definitions that we've covered so far. Classify the following either as a scalar or vector. Ready for the answers? Distance is a scalar quantity. Displacement is a vector quantity. Velocity is a vector. Speed is a scalar. Even though we commonly say that we go forwards in time, it is impossible to go backwards, northwards, or to the left in time. That's why time is a scalar quantity. What about acceleration? Well, that depends. If it's just the letter A, then it's a scalar quantity. And if it's A with an arrow on top, then it's a vector quantity. You can take a look at course pack page 8 if you want to follow along with this part of the lesson. So we have these two stick friends, Adrian and Bobby. They are both in a 150 meter race. Bobby cheats and starts at the 50 meter line. What are Adrian and Bobby's position with respect to the start line? Well, Adrian is already at the start line, so her position is at zero. To describe that this is an equation for Adrian, we'll include a letter A in subscript. Bobby, on the other hand, is 50 meters east of the start line, so his equation is written as D subscript B equals 50 meters east of start. When Adrian and Bobby entered the stadium, the entrance was at the finish line, so they had to walk from the finish line back to their current starting position. So what was their displacement from the finish line? 
For Adrian, it was 150 meters west. And for Bobby, it was 100 meters west. The race is about to begin. On your marks, get set, go! Hooray, they tied! What are their positions relative to the start line? Correct, both are 150 meters east of start. But what about their respective displacements? Adrian displaced 150 meters east. Meanwhile, Bobby displaced 100 meters east. Even though they tied the race, Bobby knew that he won unfairly. So he heads back to the track and does his own bizarre version of the beat test. He starts at the 50 meter mark, sprints 60 meters east, then dashes 110 meters west, and then runs 40 meters east before calling it quits. What was his total distance traveled? If you add up 60 plus 110 plus 40, well that adds up to 210 meters. But what about his final position relative to the start line? If we take a look at the scale, it looks like he's at the 40 meter mark, so 40 meters east of start. Lastly, what is his displacement? Remember that displacement is your net travel from where you started. Bobby started at the 50 meter line and finished at the 40 meter line, so his net travel is 10 meters. Displacement is also a vector quantity, so you must also include the direction west as well. In this unit, we will be focusing on calculating motion in just one dimension. From our previous example, Adrian and Bobby traveled only east and west. As these two directions are parallel to each other, they're known as collinear vectors. When Bobby went back to the track for his training, we found his total displacement by adding all the small collinear vectors together. And the term used to describe total displacement is the resultant displacement. Vectors can be drawn on a sheet of paper as an arrow. The pointy end of the arrow is known as the head, and the opposite end is known as the tail. Depending on how long or how short this arrow is, it describes the magnitude of the vector. All vectors must have an arrowhead, as it is used to describe the direction of the vector. Now when you draw a vector inside a scale diagram, you must always include a scale and a compass rose. You might notice the scale is measured in meters per second. That means this vector is describing a velocity at a rate of 7.5 meters per second. Here's an example. A girl named Cassidy walks 2 meters west, then 12 meters west, and finally walks 8 meters east. What is her total distance of travel? Good. 2 plus 12 plus 8 equals 22. What about her resultant displacement? If you're good at mental math, you would have gotten the answer 6 meters west. Let's solve this problem graphically. The rule for solving the addition of vectors together is to connect them from head to tail. The big vector, in this case the resultant vector, can be determined by measuring the length from the tail of the first vector to the head of the last vector drawn. So here are the three vectors drawn according to scale. Normally this is done on graph paper, but I'll include a number line below to help us count. Cassidy starts right here. Yes, pun intended. We start by connecting the yellow vector to the start. Then we connect the tail of the orange vector to the head of the yellow vector. Next, we connect the tail of the red vector to the head of the orange vector. The resultant vector starts at the beginning and points to the head of the last vector drawn. When we measure out the length of this vector, it works out to 6 meters west. We can also solve the same problem mathematically. Here's the mathematical formula. As you can see, we find the resultant displacement by adding all the little displacements together. When questions like these are in the form of a word problem, we need to solve the problem using a clean mathematical structure. Do you remember the memory aid GRASP? If not, we'll go through it together. The first thing that you do when you solve a word problem is to tell the reader what numbers you know. These are your givens. D1 is 2 meters west, D2 is 12 meters west, and D3 is 8 meters east. R is for require. 
In other words, what value are you looking for? A delta dr followed by a question mark is sufficient. A is for analysis. In other words, what formula is needed to solve the problem? Since there are three givens, we stop the formula at delta d3. S is for solve, so we substitute the values into the formula and solve the problem. Lastly, P is for paraphrase. You could write down, therefore, Cassidy's displacement was 6 meters west, but how about we just box in the final answer here? I know that when it comes to unit test time, you'll have about a half a dozen questions to solve in 70 minutes. So if I see that you've boxed in your final answer, it'll be our little agreement that this is your final paraphrased statement. How about that? Now this version of solving the problem takes a long time to write down. Remember earlier when I said that directions can assume a sign convention? How will we take that to our advantage? So this time around, we'll tell the reader that we'll assume that east is positive. That means that west will be a negative value. So 2 meters west will be represented as negative 2 meters. 12 meters west will be represented as negative 12 meters. And 8 meters east will be just plus 8 meters. The plus sign is not necessary. We'll still need our R for require, A for analysis, S for substitute and solve, and as long as you box in your final answer, you'll receive full marks in solving the problem this way. Just make sure that if your answer is a vector, make sure that you describe the vector as a positive value, so negative 6 meters east should be written down as 6 meters west. Physics is an international language, and your thoughts and ideas need to be written down in a way that others can follow along. This is all part of the grammar of physics. That's why you'll need to show all this work for full marks on a lab report, quiz, or on a unit test. We'll finish off the lesson with reading and interpreting graphs. Let's say there was a gentleman named Mr. Nee, and he walked forwards, paused, and then walked back to a starting point. Which of the two graphs represents a distance time graph of this scenario? The left one? Or the right one? Hopefully you chose the left one. It doesn't matter if Mr. Nee walks in a straight line, in a square, or in a circle. As long as he walks, his distance will keep on increasing. The graph on the right is properly known as a position time graph, as it shows where his position is as time goes by. Here are some random position time graphs, and I want you to match each graph with the following statements. You can pause the video and write your answers down. Are you ready for the answers? E represents an object at rest. Even though A and D look similar, a line with a shallower slope would represent an object that is moving slowly, and a steeper slope would represent an object that is moving quickly. Any object that is accelerating would cause a curve to form on a position time graph. Tonight's homework can be found on course pack page 8. A copy of the course pack can be downloaded in the description box below. Also, if you look carefully at the bottom of each page, the answers to each night's homework are written down there. If you find any mistakes in the answer key, please let me know, and I'll place an extra sticker on your next unit test as a thank you. I'll see you next episode.